Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to our first session of walkthroughs. Uh, so the first walkthrough today is Chris Cave Ayland, who is going to talk about how to use Git to look like a very stable genius. All right. Thanks very much for coming out. Uh, first thing. Sorry, just figuring out what screen is what. Excellent. OK. Um, <coughs> cool. So let's talk a little bit about Git. But first of all, I want to start with the survey. Who here, hand on heart, honestly believes they embody these things about being a developer? By show of hands. Weird. OK. That's odd. Nobody. OK. Um, so maybe the conclusion from that is we're all bad at our jobs. But probably not, right? There's quite a few of us in here. Probably some of us are good at our jobs. Um, so we can probably conclude instead that maybe ideal developer does not exist. Maybe ideal developer is a bit of a fiction. Maybe we should worry not so much about being ideal developer. And the real reason I sort of uh, wanted to put this talk together was when I started as an RSE. Um, I think I had what is probably a very common experience, which is showing up and probably kind of thinking I knew what I was doing and then uh, feeling like I was quickly disabused of that when I sort of looked at other people's PRs or I sneaked a peek at other people's branches or something. And, uh, you know, it can be really difficult not to do this sort of comparison where you look at your own thing uh, and you look at someone else's uh, nice little branch uh, that all works first time and it's very good. And it can be very difficult to look at that and not sort of draw some conclusions about this person must be great and I must be terrible. But this is kind of a weird thing, this thing we have with like our Git histories, right? I don't know if there's any other like profession. I don't, I, I don't have much experience outside of developing software in academia. Is there any other profession where you submit a bit of work uh, and you submit not just the final bit of work, you also submit all the sort of half a dozen botched versions like you created on the way. Here's the, here's the expense report. Here's the other six versions of it where I sort of did it wrong. Probably not, right? So it's this weird thing in, the, in software where we're sort of asked to expose our workings, show our, show our sort of secrets. And, uh, uh, and it's, it's, it's tricky. It's difficult. It's, uh, it takes guts. And I guess this is probably setting quite a low bar for a 40-minute conference talk. But there's basically only sort of one thing I want you to come away from this session with, right? Um, I've increasingly come to believe that like comparing yourself to someone else's Git history is a lot like comparing yourself to someone else's social media profile. It's a complete waste of time and it's very bad for your mental health. Um, and I don't believe we should be trying to turn ourselves into ideal developer so that we can have the perfect clean Git history. That's impossible. Instead, try to realize the truth. What truth? There is no Git history. It is air. It is wind. It is nothing at all whatsoever. It is entirely malleable, and there is no reason that <laughs> your Git history has to have anything to do with the last week or so that you spent doing things. So therefore, any comparison is pointless, right? What, oops, what we get on the right doesn't probably happen by accident, right? It doesn't happen because someone comes along and just like does everything perfectly first time. It's probably because they spend a bit of time with Git and they know how to make things look nice. So when it comes to uh, actual real world problem solving, it's really hard to like sort of marry up the kind of some of the things we get told about uh, you know working effectively uh, or anything else. And uh, you know future employers, please look away. But this is more like what I actually do <laughs> on when I'm solving a bit of a problem, right? Generally, I start off in a stage of confusion, which can last from anything from ten minutes to two weeks. Um, you know, I do. To, figure out what is actually going on, get my head around kind of the scope of what is actually happening, figure out what some of the parts in play are. And that can take a while. <clears throat> Eventually, I get bored of milling around in confusion. I'm like, right, I'm just going to do something. I'm going to write something. Something, you know, any like, little bit where I'm like, OK, I'm pretty sure I know what that bit should look like. I'm going to write that. There we go. Now I have a thing. I have like a concrete thing. 
And from there, from having a concrete thing, you can try and sort of bootstrap your way into the more nebulous, ill-defined thing. You have a bit of structure that you can, you can write off of. And then once you've got sort of a little bit of a thing, a little thing that sort of addresses the problem that you're actually trying to solve, you start to iterate. And now things sort of hopefully start to fall out, make a bit more sense. Uh, and uh, you sort of get close to the problem. And then eventually you're like, OK, right, I should finish off all the other the kind of boring stuff around the edges that I've been meaning to do for a while. Who thinks that sounds a bit more like how they actually end up working day to day? There's some hands. Yeah, OK. Right, so how do we um, insert Git and like GitHub into this complex, fairly nebulous process? Right? I mean, certainly if we uh, you know, follow the advice you get given all the time with Git, certainly if you read online, you, you get advice like, oh, create small, frequent commits. Um, that's fair enough, yeah. Um, but you know, you definitely end up with your history on the left <laughs> if you do that through this chaotic process of problem solving, right? Um, and uh, it can be difficult to sort of figure out, like, well, when do I start committing? You know, uh, at what point have I moved from just mucking around with some stuff that's probably not going to end up being the solution to, oh, this is actually something that is uh, is going to sort of be worth keeping and uh, and something. Uh, that should go in. It's probably something you often only know in retrospect. Right. So what I'm going to talk about today is all of the stuff you can do, or at least some of the stuff you can do uh, with your with Git to lie, to uh, <laughs> to uh, tell anyone any story you would like about how you have uh, how you've gone about solving a problem. Uh, but first, some disclaimers. I don't claim any of this stuff is a good idea, or something you should do, or something you should want to do. It's certainly something you can do. Um, I don't know that you should. My work setup can charitably be pre-described as esoteric. I don't recommend that you try and work uh, in the way I do. In about in a few minutes, you will lose all respect for me when you see which uh, text editor I use. Um, but until then, try and bear with me. Git is complicated, right? I think we all know Git is complicated. We've seen a fair amount of Git. You will probably, if attempting this stuff, get yourself into a right mess, and it will waste an afternoon as you attempt to get yourself out of your right mess. So bear that in mind. All the stuff we're going to do can probably be done in a bunch of different ways, better ways. I don't know. This comes, comes back to Git is complex, right? There's upteen different ways of, of doing things generally. Uh, and I'm not claiming that the way I end up doing things is the best way of doing things. But there are probably other ways of doing it. There are probably better ways of doing it. Go and find them out if you're interested. The other thing to bear in mind is that the concept of a clean Git history is an ill-defined, open-ended target. Your time may be spent better elsewhere. Yeah. Spending your time chasing this perfect Git history may be better spent actually doing some productive work. Please don't walk away from this thinking you need to learn a bunch of Git nonsense in order to be, quote unquote, good developer. There is no job spec out there you will ever read that says it must have a super clean Git history in it. Uh, and the last caveat is uh, Git has loads of different interfaces. Porcelains, as Git calls it. Um, I don't know what they all do. I don't know how they all work. I don't know what they can do. Uh, probably a lot of people use VS Code. Probably use the Git integrations there. I don't use VS Code, so I don't know what that, that can do. I don't know what the PyCharm integrations can do. I don't know anything else. Uh, so there's no point asking me if a particular Git interface can do anything in particular, because I don't know. Um, oh, yeah, one, uh, one interesting side note, right? Have you come across this term porcelains for Git? Like, it's, it's a weird one, right? I've only ever heard this in the, in the, in the, in the Git world. And it literally just means this, right? <laughs> the reference is, uh, the, uh, well, the metaphor is the idea of uh, porcelain that goes in front of plumbing. So you have Git plumbing, which is the internals of Git, and then you have the interface to that plumbing, which is porcelain. Um, 
definitely a bit of an aside, but I find it a very vivid image. Right, after our heap of disclaimers, um, why, why is it worth paying attention to any of the stuff I've talked about? I think all talks should have like a big disclaimers side where you tell people not to listen to you. I think that's a good idea. Um, <clears throat> you may not need it, you may not want to need it, but it's always good to know what's possible, right? It's always good to know what, the, uh, what, what, what can be done. Other people are probably going to do this stuff. Other people's Git histories will warp and weave in front of you, and uh, it's good to know that they're just doing some of this stuff. And ultimately, I think there is a case to be made for crafting one's Git history. We'll get, and I'll get into like what I think that case is in a minute. Um, you know, and if it happens to make you look good, oh well. But as ever, the main takeaway is that, you know, if someone's Git history looks too good to be true, it almost certainly is. Right, so this is um, sort of how I'm thinking about sort of, you know, Git history uh, and, and what it can be uh, sort of evolved over time. I'm, Actually, joking on the last one, that's not, not true. Um, we should not be sitting around trying to use Git to make ourselves look great, whatever I wrote in my abstract. Uh, instead, I ended up thinking about my Git history as something that can uh, aid understanding. And this is basically the same thing we do in all the code we write. We write our code sustainably, we write our code in a way that helps people to understand it, and I think our Git history can be used in the same way, right? It can be used as a tool so that when I come back in six months' time and I'm looking at my thing, I can have a proper understanding, a quick and easy understanding of what it was I did. Someone reviewing my PRs can look at my Git history and learn something, can infer something about how I work and use that to uh, you know, examine my code. And there's three sort of broad kind of sweeps of things I want to look at today. Talking about crafting individual commits, crafting your history, and then sort of crafting your repository. Um, and the word crafting here is quite carefully chosen. Um, that is what I kind of think it, it, you know, it ends up being, is, is sort of thinking about putting together these things in a quite a careful and structured way. I think I'm probably going to have to sit down for this bit, because it's like an awkward typing height for the desk. Right, a few assumptions. Pro, I'm kind of assuming you have kind of a basic kind of working Git knowledge. You probably, you know, enough to be working in some sort of collaborative projects. You're used to staging and committing all your stuff. You're used to branching and merging, probably used to doing PRs and things uh, and working with remotes. Um, and then we're gonna try and build some stuff on top of that. Some of it will be probably stuff you know already. Some of it, hopefully, might not be. Right. So when it comes to crafting commits, I think there's sort of three main things you can think about. Choosing what goes in, trying to like make a nice commit to begin with. Um, <clears throat> making changes and fixing things because you know we don't do, do things right first time and it's, uh, it's always nice to be able to fix things up. Uh, and some ways of stopping yourself from uh, making quote unquote bad commits in the first place. Right, so uh, what have we got? We've got a little Django project, which is what we're gonna kind of use to demo some stuff. Um, don't worry too much about this. It's a very standard structure for, for Django project stuff. We're only gonna worry about a few files that are actually in this app directory, just giving you guys a kind of feel for where we sit overall. Let's do a git status. So we've got a bunch of changes, we've got some untracked files. So the sort of scenario I'm kind of going for here is that we, um, you know, we went into our sort of trance of problem solving and um, did a load of clever stuff and, uh, you know, it's all come out nicely, we think we have a nice solution to things, but the haze has sort of lifted and uh, we've realized we haven't done any git along the way or anything and we should probably do some git. Um, <clears throat> So um, obviously our first thought in this situation is like, okay, how do I conceal the fact that I've not been an ideal developer? I need to like put some git in so that it looks like I've been, been proper and good. <clears throat> um, 
This is probably going to be unhappy. Yeah. Let's do that. Right. So I'm going to try and sort of show you things from two angles today. One is just the Git command line, because it is the interface that I know that you guys will all have access to. You'll all have access to on all of your systems, uh, on, even on, on the HPC, etc. cetera. Um, <clears throat> so, I'm all, but I'm also going to show you um, how I actually end up working with Git day to day. Uh, because the Git command line has plenty of limitations. Um, and the interface I use, this is the bit where I confess my text editor, is, uh, is based in Emacs. Um, Emacs has this, uh, this great package called Magit, which is its kind of go-to Git interface. Um, if I summon that up, there we go. This hopefully looks like a fairly kind of familiar view of, uh, of kind of repositories, one track files and state changes. So I normally work in a virtual machine, but for uh, reasons of university bureaucracy, <laughs> I'm actually reduced to working in uh, Windows subsystem for Linux at the moment. So I can't actually show this to its uh, nicest effect. We have to have this embedded in the terminal version, which is okay, but it's not as, not as nice as it could be, but uh, we'll manage. So um, yeah, these are the two ways. I'm gonna, the idea is we'll try and do things on the command line. When it gets a bit tricky, we'll try and show how tools like Magit, interfaces of uh, whatever sort, can make your life a lot, lot easier. And it was, it was kind of picking up Magit that kind of was the thing that, that sort of started me thinking more about my Git history and, uh, and what can we do with it, because it removes a lot of those barriers to, uh, to like working with Git. Anyway, for the uh, for the time being, right? So our our haze is lifted, and we realise we should probably do some commits or something. Let's do a get diff, uh, sort of like you know, get a feel, right? What did we actually end up writing? Oh lord, um, I'm not going to go through it all. What I will say is like. Let's assume we look through it, we know what we're doing, and we kind of figure out, okay, we kind of actually ended up with two fairly separate components, right? So we've got this user info class and this access record class, and they're both actually kind of independent from one another. So we should probably make two separate commits, right? One where we add in the, uh, the, the, some of the user info related stuff, and one where we add in this kind of access related stuff. And there's a bunch of changes. Uh, in all of these files. Some of it is to do with the user info stuff, uh, as it is uh, up here. So we have some test cases for our user info, and we have a test case for our access record stuff. But it's all pretty independent. <clears throat> so let's do our get status again. Right, so we want to like commit half of the stuff that we've got, not all of it. Um, so our basic, you know, interface for adding stuff or whatever is obviously, I'll tell you what, I'm going to cd into the app directory because everything is in there. Uh, our basic interface is obviously just git add. Model sort py. There's a bit of a problem there, right? Because we can't just add the file because there's a whole bunch of mixed changes in here. Stuff that we want to include in the, in the commit and stuff that we don't want to include, include in the commit. So we want the user info stuff, we don't want the access record stuff. So we can't just say git add the file. Uh, instead, we have to use an extra option to git add. Use git add patch. And give it models.py. And then we get a bit more of an intelligent interface. Uh, and git kind of says, it'll go through all of the sets of changes in your file and say, hey, do you want this bit? Yes or no? This is all still one contiguous block of changes. It still contains both of the things, and we only want one of the things. Um, so we need to further refine this. You'll notice we have loads of these different options at the bottom. We can hit question mark, and it'll actually tell us what they all do. You can individually choose the status hunk, you know, accept everything from the file, and so on and so on. But what we're actually interested in here is this uh, E. We manually edit the current hunk. Again, hunk, beautifully unclear Git terminology. It's great. So this basically just opens up the, uh, the, the particular patch that we were looking at in your text editor, and then you just chuck away the things you don't want. So 
Uh, let's just get, around, get rid of the access record stuff, just keep the user info stuff. Save and close. Git returns to the command line, and we look at git status again. We've got some staged and some unstaged stuff. Uh, and if we do git diff staged, indeed, we can see we only got the bit that, from the file that we wanted from the file. So that's okay. That sort of works. It's not fantastic, obviously, as an interface. You know, uh, getting that menu up with a bunch of obscure options, opening, having to open things in your separate text editor in order to, to, uh, to do stuff. Um, and there's some, in more complex cases, it, you know, it'll, it'll give you some more options as well. So actually, tell you what, let's look at, so git patch is really good for, for working with sort of individual files, adding bits of an individual file. You can do a more sort of project level look at things by using git add interactive. Uh, and this gives you another one of these little interactive menus. Again, not super amazing, not super clear. You know, you can um, use this to go through your whole project, figure out which bits you want to add, which bits you don't. So for instance, we can say four, and then that gives us the untracked files, and we can choose which of those that we want to add. One, two, and five, I think. Yep. And then it puts a star next to them to say, okay, I'm gonna add them. Then you hit return, and then it actually adds them. Um, we can access that same uh, patch-based interface as well with five. So let's do that for uh, the views file. And we get a very similar, similar sort of take on things. It takes us back to the same patching menu. This is actually a slightly more complex case. So we don't have, we have two separate blocks of, uh, of changes here. So we get this extra S option down in the menu. It says basically, do you want to split this into a smaller bit? We can say, yes, please, I would like to split that. Uh, and then it's automatically kind of taken out the two parts for us. Um, that looks all right, so why don't we add that? And then we're left over the second bit of the access record related stuff. And uh, we don't want that, we'll just throw that away. And let's assume we're sort of done and just quit out of our interface check out git status and <clears throat> as expected, we've got all of our new files and we've added some stuff from views as well. So that's okay, it's not particularly great. You will probably be unsurprised to learn that your text editor or your, uh, your, you know, your, Git, your alternative Git interface is a lot better at doing this sort of thing, right? Um, Text, your text editor in particular is quite good at adding uh, the sort of Git, uh, you know, line by line sort of Git context, letting you perform operations line by line on stuff uh, very easily. So the, uh, the nice thing about this magic interface is that it's, it's very Emacsy, uh, which means it's all, it's all about doing things with like the minimum number of keystrokes. Um, but we can go to our, we can jump down to our unstaged changes. You can sort of pop open these individual sections, look what we've got, that's just access record stuff, don't need that. That's a mix of stuff, so we're gonna want some of this stuff, and we just highlight the lines we want, and you press S to stage them. And we probably want that top bit as well. Then let's go to the URLs file, and yeah, let's just stage that line. It's just a lot easier and smoother, and this is kind of the thing where, where your, your text editor is gonna be really good at letting you add a bunch of stuff. Okay. So putting together, you know, I, uh, this is sort of a habit I've gone into now, is just sort of sitting down before I make any commit, just sort of sitting down thinking like, right, what needs to go in here, going through things file by file, trying to put together like what actually makes a nice commit. The one limitation with this sort of partially adding of things is that with new files, you can't do the partial staging for some reason. I don't know, it's some sort of uh, weird limitation on Git internals, I think. So we have, that's kind of the basics. That's probably, if, if you've seen anything, that's probably uh, something you're fairly used to doing already. Um, but we can also go a lot 
Um, but we, you know, there's, we also want to make sure this is good content, right? So it would be really nice to run our tests before we actually commit any of this thing to make sure that everything we put in the commit is actually consistent and works correctly and is, is right. Um, but we have a little problem. If I go ahead and run our tests, um, it's going to actually run every, eh, thank you, Debian. It's actually going to run everything, right? It's including all of the access record stuff. So we have a bunch of staged, unstaged content that's still around, and when we run our tests, all of that unstaged content is still being included. So this isn't a great check that our commit is like well put together and it's actually going to work, that our tests will pass for our commit. So what would be good is if we could just get rid of all of the, uh, the currently unstaged stuff and then run our tests and, uh, and have everything work nicely. Um, for this, uh, we have git, git stash. Used without any, uh, any sort of further options or command line arguments, it basically, it takes everything. So in this case, it's gotten rid of everything except our unstaged, sorry, except our untracked files. The way it works is that um, it creates a, um, a stack where you can ask for git stash list and it will show you this list of all of the sets of changes that you've gone away and stashed. Uh, and you can just retrieve it off the top of the stash by saying something like git stash pop and we get all our changes back. <clears throat> so that, that works well um, where you're getting rid of both if you want to just like context switch, if you just want to like go do something else, some operations Git will demand that you have a clean working tree. Uh, so in that situation, being able to just temporarily get rid of everything, Git stash, bring it back uh, is really useful. What's more useful though, like I said, would be if we could just get rid of our unstaged content and keep, all, keep everything that we've staged. It's actually really fiddly to do in, uh, in, um, on the command line, so I'm just gonna do it by magic. So if I bring up the, if I hit the help uh, in Magit, we get all this stuff that we can do. Uh, we can hit Z for stashing, uh, and it gives us a bunch of options down here. Do you want to stash? Which parts do we want to stash? Do you want to stash the index, the worst tree, or both? In this case, we just want to stash the work tree. Uh, it'll ask us for a message. And we now we get our list of stashes included down here. You'll notice, yeah, we only have our staged changes now. We don't have uh, any unstaged changes. Um, there should be some more stuff there, shouldn't there? Hmm, okay, I don't know why I did that. I somehow managed to lose a bunch of the stuff that I'd already staged. Let's just quickly chuck that back in. Okay, don't know how I managed that. Let's get rid of that. Okay, there we go. So, everything should look good, and I can stash the work tree. There we go, that looks better. Um, now, if I run my tests, we have a problem, right? So, something that we have included in the stash. So that we've included in our stage content should not actually have been there. And uh, when we actually try to run our test, it actually picks this up. So this sort of helps us um, getting things that we, uh, you know, get refining what's in our working directory down to just things that uh, are actually going to be included in the stage, helps you run these sorts of checks, make sure that you can properly put together a commit that works nicely. Um, so what do we need to do? We need to, which file was it? I lost track. Views. We need to go ahead, get rid of that reference in there. We only want that. And run our tests again. Same problem in another directory. Okay. Now the stuff that we actually have can go into a single commit. That is self-consistent, works nicely while our tests pass. I'm not actually going to create the commit. I'm just going to go ahead and summon back the, uh, the content that we previously stashed. Um, 
can do that by pulling things back. From here, so we have our unstaged content back as well as our staged content. So we could go ahead and create a commit at this point, uh, but I'm not going to because I need to move along quite a lot. Um, so that's sort of how we could, you know, you can sort of uh, build things up towards uh, creating a commit uh, by sort of selecting the content you're going to put into it. Um, but we still don't get this right all the time, right? So it's important that we're able to go back and fix things up. Git amend is by far the simplest way of doing this. Um, and, but it only really works where you, you know, want to fix up your most recent commit. Uh, again, I expect most people may have come across git amend. Um, you just stage whatever you want to include in your previous commit, run git amend and uh, git commit amend, and it will uh, put it back. Um, slightly going slightly further than that, if you want to just completely rewind the clock, you have git reset. You can just remove changes from your history. You can just go back in time, essentially, to before that you made them. Uh, you can use this to undo mergers as well. You need to use a little care that you are resetting the right branch to the right place. Right, two, in the name of moving swiftly on, um, one of the, probably the easiest sort of thing for a lot of this, the thing that certainly requires the least thought is, is putting in place some stuff that sort of uh, puts in automatic checks to sort of prevent individual bad commits, right? So Git has what it provides, provides what it calls hooks, which are basically just places where you can insert scripts that, uh, that Git will run when you do stuff. And if that script raises an error, then Git will refuse to perform the action. There is a pre-commit hook, which means you can do all this stuff. You can run uh, custom stuff before any of your commits are allowed to, uh, to proceed. You can write all your own stuff by putting files in .git hooks, but it's a lot better to use a battle-tested framework. Um, Pre-commit here is really, really good. Um, there's just an enormous stack of checks and tools and things you can run with pre-commit, uh, and you can, it's pretty easy just to pick them up off the shelf. Um, so you just have this .precommit config file here, and you can just run all your favorite QA tools or whatever here. You know, probably this is stuff that all runs in, in CI, but this is how you stop, you know, pushing to CI and, oh, my lint has failed. Blah, blah, blah. Just make sure your linter passes on every commit, and this will just make sure that anything you commit uh, is, is going to pass all your other CI. Right. So, in order to get onto the really fun stuff, let's talk a little bit about rebasing. Uh, maybe if there's anything that is actually like, properly useful and, and uh, you know, has legitimate uses, if you like. Um, rebasing is, is kind of that. It's, it's very useful to be able to move your stuff around. Your branches don't have to stay wherever it was you happened to be, you know, the project happened to be when you started working on something. It can make a lot of sense just to change the uh, location that your branch starts from, move it off to somewhere else, and, uh, and sort of keep a simpler history in your Git structure. So I keep a simpler structure in your Git history. Otherwise, you can end up in all these sort of convoluted cases where you have branches coming off branches, coming off branches. Rebasing can just help you say, right, I'm just going to move that back to main. And it gives you essentially the same, the same effect as merging, from, as merging main into a, a branch, but, um, but it just keeps your Git history a lot easier. A lot of people have very strong opinions about Git history. Uh, you know, how you should structure your branches or different flows and if you should squash commits into main, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there's lots of <laughs> different takes on that that I'm not going to uh, uh, attempt to get into. Um, but rebasing is, is just a really handy tool to have in, your, have in your, your, your kit for just moving stuff around. So I'm going to move on to second example. Repository name. Um, so this is sort of, uh, you know, we've, we've moved on a bit. We have um, a f some stuff in main, but we also have a, a sort of feature branch that does some stat stuff. Um, but at the moment, it's based off of this doc branch, right? You can see it coming up here uh, from this uh, commit that's in the doc branch. And docs has already been mained, uh, sorry, already been merged into main. So there's a closed loop here. 
Uh, and if we're going to go ahead and merge stats into main as well, you know, it's just kind of messy. You have this kind of double loop structure. It's not very nice. It's not a very clear history. Um, so rebasing uh, our stats branch onto main is just going to make our life a lot easier. I always make sure to get this in the right order. Git rebase target branch, moving branch. Main stats. If I look at my git log name, oops, I'll do git graph. It's just a lot simpler, right? This is, uh, this is our kind of closed loop branch that's, uh, that's down here. We still, oh, sorry, I'm still showing you that. It's probably not very helpful. I'll do this in, uh, do this in Magit. Still showing the origin stats thing. So this is still showing the remote version of the branch, which uh, just some config I have in my Git history for uh, that keeps showing the remote. But the main thing is the stats branch has been moved uh, up here. It's just based off main. It's a lot easier. Right. This is the really fun stuff. So um, interactive rebasing uh, is confusingly named. It's not necessarily anything to do with actually moving a branch. Rebasing kind of makes sense as a name. You're changing the base of a branch. Interactive rebasing makes no sense. We're not necessarily moving anything. Uh, instead, what it lets you do is it lets you take a chunk of Git history and basically just do whatever you want to it. Rearrange it, reorder it, add commits, combine commits, edit, insert, delete, whatever. Uh, and this is kind of the real um, uh, power that well, it's kind of the way the, you know, Git history really becomes malleable and we can do whatever we want with it. So let's do an interactive rebase onto main. What this does is it will open up your text editor. Uh, and this is the history of our branch. So this is actually, um, Magic has been slightly clever here, and it's like, oh, hang on, I can see you're trying to do an interactive rebase. I will open it up and give you some clever Magic stuff. Um, but you normally you just get this file in a text editor, and you just have to edit the contents of this file. And uh, basically, by rearranging these entries or changing the prefix, we can tell Git what we want to do with these sets of commits. So for instance, we have this stuff here where we've uh, added, um, you know, we've written like a first draft of our stats module, and then we've like finalized it. There's probably not much value in having these two separate commits here. It probably just makes sense to merge them. For that, we can just say we want to fix up. If we just, uh, if you just replace uh, pick with fix up, then um, we're telling Git, just combine this commit with the commit above it. We can do the same thing um, also for these ones. So we came along, so we did a bunch of stuff, and then we added some doc strings later. It, there's not a lot of, you know, it's not very helpful just coming along and say, okay, da, 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 there's these uninteresting commits where they added doc strings at the bottom, whatever. Um, so we might as well merge those into our previous stuff as well. We can just shift this up. Um, so we can just change the order of things in here. Uh, so this is for the stats. Uh, this is for the stats view function. So we can just shift that up next to the, uh, the, the commit where we added the stats view. Hit F again, that'll just combine them together. Uh, and then we can do the same for this calc stats function, which will go in there. And so at this point, you know, this is uh, kind of what I mean when I say history is, is nothing but air. It can all be rearranged uh, exactly as you like, put together uh, to tell any story that you would like. We go ahead and uh, tell it to, to commit that, and then look at our git log again. Yeah, so rather than all of those commits before we had, we had that was kind of a not necessarily a particularly clear, helpful narrative, we've narrowed things down. We just have three commits um, where we've added our stats module, we've added a view that makes use of the stats module, and then we've added some tests for that view. Straightforward. Probably it would have been helpful if we changed this commit message at the same time, so that we didn't, didn't say first draft anymore, but never mind. Right, uh, I am way behind, so I'm just gonna say one final word on force pushing. So everything we've done so far has assumed things are uh, being done locally. Um, 
And obviously, once you uh, start pushing things onto GitHub, et cetera, you end up in this tension. By default, Git won't let you push something to GitHub if you have rewritten your history. You can overrule it with git push forth. A lot of people, a lot of advice that goes out to beginners, I think is just don't never use git push forth, and I don't think that's true. Um, use it carefully, use it considerately. Uh, tell people if you're, if you're going to be force pushing something that they're going to be working on. It's not particularly hard for them to update to the, to the new force pushed version, um, but it's nice to let people know. Uh, and this is just really handy, particularly if you're ever like refining CI configs or whatever, you can just go back, amend any mistake you made, force push the branch back up, and it'll just, you'll never see the, uh, the, the broken config. It just uh, disappears. Um, the only place that GitHub will tell on you is um, if you've already created a PR and you force push into a PR, GitHub will tell people. So, uh, you know, if, you, if you're trying to conceal things, uh, make sure you do it before it gets to the PR stage. Um, right, I think I'm basically out of time. Um, Git is lies. <laughs> I think if you just switch that to the PC, we should be able to see the Slido for a couple of questions. And next week, <laughs> I'm not answering the top one. Um, um, occasional problem is test along CI. Yeah, okay, so I think that's where the force pushing comes in, right? So you can, you can just amend things uh, and then force push, and uh, that should um, you know, remove the, uh, the, the failed test from the history. Uh, again, make sure you do it before your PR.